Good afternoon and welcome. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone to uh, th the, this installment of our speaker series on law and the production of inequality. Um, I'll say a, a word about today's installment in a moment, but first I wanted to mention a couple of other events that are forthcoming. We have um, on your tables, you'll find some cards, flyers, brochures, some um, information about um, an event that will take place at the Rothko Chapel in Houston um, on climate justice. Um, we're bringing Elizabeth Jean-Pierre uh, here to speak about climate justice in the aftermath of um, the hurricane in Puerto Rico. And that event will be followed by uh, a symposium here on campus, uh, November 30 and December 1st, Puerto Rico in the wake of crisis toward a just afterlife of disaster, which actually dovetails a little bit with today's talk. Um, there's, a, 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 there's going to be a lot of discussion about um, sort of reestablishing, among other things, food sovereignty and self-sufficiency in, in, in a context of uh, modern day colonialism and, um, and disaster uh, or post-disaster. Um, so that will be an, uh, an exceptionally interesting event, I think. Uh, you can find more information, as I said, on your tables or on our website. Um, the, it, today's talk is the fourth um, in, a, in the series this semester. We have one more coming. Uh, Professor Hila Shamir will be talking about feminist approaches to the regulation of sex work. Patterns in Transnational Governance Feminist Lawmaking. That will be November 28th, um, so two weeks from today, and that will be the last one of the semester. Uh, but the this, this, um, semester, the series has been really quite interesting and quite fruitful, I think. A lot of uh, really interesting discussions about the role of law in the production of inequality, and so today we're very pleased um, to have Tommaso Ferrando here, who is um, going to speak about law and the reproduction of food poverty. Um, Dr. Ferrando is a lecturer in law at the University of Bristol Law School. His work, um, he works on the link between law and food with particular attention to the international dimensions of that, trade, investments, and the human right to food. Um, his latest research explores EU regulation of food waste, the role of competition law, in obstructing coordinated attempts to improve the global food system, and the idea of the food system as a commons, like air, water, or sunshine. Outside of academia, he also acts as a consultant and pro bono advocate on questions relating to the right to food and food policies. He has collaborated with the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, contributed to the formulation of an EU common food policy. He's a member of Feeding Coventry, a multidisciplinary project that aims to tackle the roots of food poverty food poverty by involving public administrators, the private sector, and civil society. Um, uh, Dr. Ferrando holds a, a PhD in law from Sciences Po University and uh, an MS in comparative law, economics, and finance from the International University College of Turin. Um, we're also very excited to have Raj Patel here. He will be our discussant today. Um, Raj uh, Patel is a research professor here at UT in the LBJ School of Public Affairs and a senior research associate at the Unit for the Humanities at Rhodes University in South Africa. He studies the world food system and alternatives to it. He is currently working on a documentary project about the food system with award-winning director Steve James. He has testified, he's a, um, in addition to being a very accomplished academic, as you'll see in a moment, he has a very public persona around these issues and, and a very strong public presence. He has testified about the causes of the global food crisis to the U.S. House of Representatives Financial Services Committee. He was an advisor to Olivier de Schuder, the, UN, the U.N. Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Um, he's published in many journals on uh, economics, philosophy, politics, international development, and public health. Um, writes for newspapers, co-hosts a podcast called The Secret Ingredient, um, and his books, interestingly, we've had two conversations so far today about uh, with people for whom his books really kind of launched them into thinking about food um, and food production, his, his, um, his book Stuffed and Starved um, and The Value of Nothing, 
um, I think prompted a lot of thought around these issues. And his latest book, which um, I've read recently, is really an interesting piece um, called A History of the World and Seven Cheap Things, A Guide to Capitalism, Nature, and the Future of the Planet with Jason Moore. So thank you, Raj, for agreeing to come. And thank you, Tommaso, for coming all the way here um, to present for us. Uh, and I'll leave you to it. All right, I'll, I'll be standing so that I can see faces and I can notice where people are falling asleep, like even back there in the last, last table. Uh, I'm extremely excited and pleased and honored to, to be here. It's, it's fantastic, not only because I've been learning about the Rappaport for so many years and knowing some of the people who make this center um, a great term of reference in the world of international law and human rights, uh, but even more because like, when else in my life could happen that I'm giving a talk and then Raj is commenting on it? Just like, <laughs> so the world is upside down, there's something that doesn't really work uh, today. So, of course, I, I really want to thank the people from the Rappaport Center, I want to thank uh, Kate, I want to thank Dan, I want to thank Karen Engel, who hopefully we'll see this video one day and realize that I thanked her. Um, <laughs> and I want to thank Raj for, for accepting to be discussant and all of you to, for, for being here uh, this afternoon. So my talk will be on law and the reproduction of food poverty, but before I start talking about what I want to talk, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the indigenous community and the n uh, Native Americans who used to populate Texas and live in Texas uh, way before the colonial project started and was uh, rooted in this country. So the Tonkawa, the Lipan Apaches, and the Comanches. And I'm doing that not only as a matter of like rec recognizing the the role that indigenous communities and Native Americans had been having like in creating the food system and the way in which they've been wiped out. But talking about food poverty and injustice in the food sector without thinking about Native Americans, I think would be a, a great miss. Um, we can talk more about that. I'm not an expert of, of Native Americans and I'm not an expert of indigenous communities in, in this part of the world, but definitely the way in which the colonial project and settler colonialism has affected and changed a food system that was based on very different promises uh, than the one that we have today is evident. Uh, the ecology of the food system that used to be before, the role of women in the food system that was completely wiped out by colonization. So it's not just um, to recognize that and acknowledge that, but it's also to make the case that there's a lot that has been happening here where we are uh, that connects with what I'm discussing in the next 35 to 40 minutes, uh, hopefully. Okay, so why are we talking about food poverty uh, when we think about uh, inequality. I would say that the most immediate response is that there is a clear divergence, a clear trend that is taking place today. On the one hand, you have uh, TV programs and shows and chefs going around the world and showing us these three stars, four stars, five stars, Michelin restaurants, and how amazing food can be and the pleasure that food produces to us and provides to us. On the other hand, if you walk down the street of any city, any place in the world, Austin as much as Bristol, where I come from, you see people are struggling to get access to food and they're struggling to feed themselves and to, and to survive. So this is the first pretty much evident inequality that we can see at the level of consumption. What I want to discuss today, and I think is, is more interesting and probably more in line with the work that the Rappaport Center has been doing and more in line with what you have been, have been doing, is this idea that the inequality and the injustice uh, do not stop at the level of consumption, it's not just a matter of like someone in the elite is getting access to very expensive, sophisticated food and the rest of the world doesn't have this opportunity, but it's the construction itself of the food system through a series of historical and present injustices that have created a continuous conflict between uh, those who have and those who can have and the rest that is um, subordinated and that is needed in order to reproduce the food system. So what I'm trying to discuss today, what I like to, the message that I would like to convey is this idea that there are people and natural resources and nature that are subordinated to the creation of a food system that is then providing for the few. So I will be starting with a very grim and pessimistic list of the things that don't work in the food system. I know that someone has been already saying that the Rappaport Center only invites people who are very negative and pessimistic and <laughs> nothing works in the world and et cetera. But the idea is that if we look at that, what doesn't work and then we try to be a little bit you know, optimistic and, and, and to empower ourselves, we may go out there and try to make um, a difference. So 
In 2017, so last year, the number of undernourished people all over the world um, reached 121 million. The data per se is already very, uh, very high. It means one out of nine people in the world. The point is that the data, the data and the figures are increasing, and they have been increasing in the last three years since 2015. So every year in the last three years, there are more people who have a hard access or do not have access to food on a, on a daily basis than the year before. Um, what is interesting is that of these 800 millions, the majority is represented by small-scale farmers, so farmers who actually produce food, farm workers who are involved in the production of food, but they work on someone else's uh, land, and people who move to the cities because they have lost access to the means of production, they've lost access to land, and they find in the city the only opportunity uh, to think of a, better, of a better future. Of these 800 million, 151 million are children. That means that one out of five children in the world is undernourished, so it doesn't have access to an adequate or sufficient amount of nutrition and calories. Um, we may think, and that's the way in which I grew up, that the struggle for food is just a matter of the global south. It's only happening in other countries distant and far away from the privileged place where I was, was born and, and, and I grew up. But if you think about the US, 40 million people are struggling for food. So it's been considered food insecure in 2017, which is around the 12% of the population. And in the UK, which is the country where I come from, like because I work there, not because I'm, I'm British, um, the statistics is even higher, that 18% of the population who is struggling for food and doesn't have uh, access to adequate food on a daily basis, which represents almost the 18% of the population. And that's in terms of absence of food. But of course, the, the problems with the food system go beyond the fact of not having enough food. Uh, while there are 800 million people food insecure, there is the 39% of the global population who is overnourished for different reasons, and we can talk about that. Why is it that people are overnourished, they receive too many calories? And um, a third of that, so around 13% of the global population, has passed the <laughs> threshold of obesity. So we have a food system that on one hand starves, and on the other ha hand starves. And that's what Raj was writing already in 2007, so nothing, nothing new. So we have a problem of consumption on both ends of the spectrum. We have a problem of production. So I just looked at the statistics in the US, um, farmers are expected to lose 15% of their um, net income in 2018 after losing 45% of net income in the last three years. So being a farmer is not paying anymore. And the only solution that a lot of farmers, including the US are finding, is just leaving the land that is bought by someone else who can concentrate and implement large scale agriculture. So if that is happening in the global north, in the global south the situation is even more problematic. Um, you may be familiar with that. There are countries like Colombia, um, Ivory Coast, or um, Ecuador, etc., that have been creating their economy out of exporting specific commodities, specific food for the global market. And the current price for these commodities, like cocoa and coffee, is so low that, farmer, that farmers, when they sell the products, they're selling under the cost of production. And that means that they can get in debt, they can just sell whatever they can and lose money, or they can abandon the land and maybe <coughs> find a solution somewhere else. So we have problems in terms of consumption, we have problems in terms of production. We also throw away 30% of the food that is produced, with very differences among countries, countries like the United States and Europe and European countries are particularly good at throwing food at the retail stage, so when the food gets to the supermarket, and at the stage of consumption. So on average, uh, we think and consider that 30% of the food that is bought in a European country is thrown away by the people <coughs> who buy it, uh, which is a lot. So this is about the effect and the impact of the food system on people. But the same food system that we're describing is responsible for the loss of 24 billion tons of fertile soil. So, soil. so we are losing fertility. We have a food system that is taking resources and nutrients from the soil and it's not putting it back. And we have a global food system that is contributing to between 13 and 18% of the greenhouse gas emission uh, at, the global, at the global level. And you can imagine that there are two statistics, the impact on the fertility of the soil and the impact on greenhouse gases uh, affect predominantly those people who are already in condition of sufferance, that are the most marginalized, there are those who are not in the condition of being resilient. So the list go, could go on and on. I think that I've been already pessimistic enough. Um, well, the message was from farm to fork, 
the global food system appears in deep crisis, both socially and environmentally. It seems to be a food system that is not really doing the job of what a food system should be doing, rather the opposite. The sad part of all of that, if you look at the same food system, you realize that there are few actors that are definitely profiting of the food system that we have. So in 2017, the same year that I was discussing, where 821 million people couldn't have uh, constant access to food, the largest food and beverage company in the world, which is Abi InBev, which is mainly specialized in beers, um, generate 56 billion in revenues and 8 billion um, in record profits. So never made as much money as in 2017. As I was saying, Abi InBev is mainly specialized in beers, and they sold, that's the statistics that I found, 600 million hectoliters of beer, which I don't know how many pints that would be, but probably a long day in the pub. <laughs> but what is interesting is that this statistic and this money is made out of uh, activity that requires a lot of water, and we are in a world where one out of nine people lack access to save water. Same year, Nestle, that you probably know, uh, the second largest food and beverage company in the world, produced 91 billion in revenues, and a profit of 7.3 billion. And just to give you an example, they, they generate so much revenues and they're so reliable that they concluded an agreement with Starbucks uh, of the value of 7.3 billion, so that now um, Nestle can sell a Starbucks product. What is interesting is that Nestle has structured its business around coffee and cocoa, which are exactly those commodities that farmers in countries like Colombia, Ivory Coast, and et cetera, are struggling to sell because of the low price in the market. So we can see immediately that the low price in the market that is forcing farmers to leave their land or to struggle or to get indebted is generating massive revenues somewhere else in the world. 2017 was also the year of the Bayer and Monsanto merger. You may be familiar with that. I'll get back to that when I talk about the role of law in, in all of that. And overall, like the last, uh, I would say, 14 to 15 years, have been years where financial actors and financial interests have been increasingly profiting out of the food system. So between 2004 and 2013, the amount of financial investment coming from financial actors like asset managers, pension fund, and et cetera, going to the agri-food system multiplied at least four times. So we have hundreds of billions that the pension funds, uh, mutual funds, hedge funds are investing in the food sector, willing and knowingly that they will be extracting returns between the 7 and the 12 percent. And among these, there is like the very interesting case of BlackRock. You may be familiar with BlackRock. It's the largest asset manager in the world. They manage more assets than the annual GDP of Japan, to give you a sense. And they became very much interested in the food sector, so much that in 2011, they released a video that I suggest that you watch. It's on, it's on YouTube where they explain how agriculture as a new and thriving sector is gonna be the best place where to put their money and to invest. So financial actors are investing in the food sector, are extracting revenues, are extracting rent from the food sector. More importantly, they are deciding more and more with their decisions, mm -hmm. what is produced, where is produced, who gets to eat, who doesn't get to eat, and also who doesn't get to produce because their production is too expensive and it's not competitive with the kind of production that they want. And if you want to talk more about fin finance and financialization of the sector, I would be more than uh, interested in hearing from you and answering in the, in the Q&A. So that's about big players. But also we cannot forget that the same food system that I'm criticizing, that I'm discussing now, is the food system that is giving me, like in, in Europe, like with uh, financial possibility access and unprecedented access to food from all over the world at any time of the year. Uh, I'm not suggesting that I eat strawberries in January, I'm not suggesting that you should be doing that, but we also have to be aware that that's the system that at least I am experiencing on a daily basis, where if I have the resources, I have access. Um, at the same time, to use the notion of cheapness of food and the role of, of the cheap food in the overall economic uh, construction, the fact that the food system is operating the way it is operating is giving the possibility to millions of people to have access to nutrition and calories, mainly calories, that otherwise they would not have access to. So the same system that is generating all this problem and all these issues produce cheap food that keeps the machine going. So after everything that I, that I, that I said, I think that we can altogether look at the food system and, and understand the deep contradictions 
that characterize, um, that characterize the food system, and we should start thinking about the role of law and, and the economic system. So we see people with unprecedented access to, access to food, people who can only survive thanks to cheap calories and, and then get sick because of the quality of what they're eating. We see 800 million people who do not have regular access to food, a planet on the verge of collapse. We see the struggle of small-scale farmers connected with the billions of, of profits and revenues made by uh, big corporations. And we see a shift in the decision-making and a shift in the way in which food is <laughs> conceived. So the question that animates a little bit my, my contribution is, shall we be surprised, and what is the role of law in all of that? For what regards, like, the first question, shall we be surprised? I think if you're familiar with the work that, that Raj has been doing and other authors have been doing, like Aragi, Harvey, Moore, Friedman, and the people have been writing about uh, food regimes, you should definitely not be surprised. The um, link between global exploitation of labor, cheapness of food, ecological extinction and capital accumulation are clear, are visible, and are, have been there for hundreds of years. So the colonial pro project, the enclosure of communal land and indigenous land in the West and the colonies, the idea that nature is appropriable and is an object that can be subordinated, the enslavement of people and their forced integration in the system of production and the plantations, the witch hunt and the marginalization of women who used to be at the center of society and the food system, all these events are connected with the origins of today's global system of production, distribution, and consumption of food, and are in themselves contradictory but united. And that's a, a, that's a very important concept that Ar Aragi uses a lot, this idea that the contradiction that keep together the system. So if we look backward, we realize that the food history of the North and the South, the factory workers and the slaves, the deforestation of the Amazon and the thriving markets in Amsterdam or Manchester or even Bristol, which was the center of slave trade uh, of the UK, are all connected together, are all part of the same system. There's a quote that I think explains it much better than I could be doing, so I will just read it. Um, and that's a quote of, by Dubois, who writes, and I'm quoting, the history of white working class struggle cannot be understood separate from the privilege of whiteness, to which the white working classes of Britain and the United States laid claim in their demands for equal political rights." End quote. So if the privilege of whiteness is connected with the working class, the working class and the white privilege is also connected with the colonies and enslavement. And he continues the quote, the quote saying, it was the ever-expanding frontier of imperialism and racial capitalism that pacified the white working class with the threat of replacement and promise of a share of the spoils." End quote. So the existence of the colonies, and in particular the cheap food produced in the colonies as a history of the seven cheap things, of the world in seven cheap things uh, discusses, um, was central to the success of the Industrial Revolution, central to the establishment of capitalism as the main form of organization of people and nature. So, to conclude with another quote of, of Dubois, the history of racial capitalism, and we could say also the history of the global food system, is a history of wages as well as whips, of factories as well as plantation, of whiteness as well as blackness, of freedom as well as slavery." End quote. So from colonization onward, we see a clear project of establishing a global food system where disposable people and disposable nature are subordinated to the logic of dispossession, <laughs> appropriation, and allocation according to the monetary value, and the satisfaction of few people's desire, and normally the desire of those who control the food system. The global planetary and social boundaries, to use the, the idea that Kate Rowett has been using recently with this idea of the donut economy, where there are planetary boundaries at the, at the outset, and then in the inner part is represented by the social boundary. This idea that there was a limit was definitely not part of the, of the project. So throughout the center, century, the global food system has been thriving out of social inequality and ecological perturbance. People and nature have been repeatedly integrated, exploited, and failed. And this continues to happen today. And I will give some few pessimistic examples of mm -hmm. how things have been happening in the last 40 years, just to 40, 50 years, just to give you a sense of the fact that it's not only about 500 years ago and, and the colonial project, but it's about the construction of the world as we, as we know it. 
So one of the most important things from the perspective of, of the United States and the, and the Global North is the role of subsidies and for the students of uh, political studies and et cetera. That means the intervention of the state promoting and sustaining agriculture in the Global North with billions and billions of dollars that are uh, flowing from the central government to farmers in the Global North. This is a characteristic of the way in which the American agricultural system and the European agricultural system are constructed. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can see the impact that that can have on the competitiveness of the goods. Making food cheap by subsidizing it means that it's going to be more competitive on the global market. So subsidies are already connected with this idea of inequality at the global level. But interestingly, there is also an internal inequality that is reproduced by the subsidies. And these are statistics that I've been uh, looking at. In the US, the top 10 farm subsidy recipients receive an average of 1.2 million a year in subsidies, which is 30 times the average early income of US families. So if you have a lot of land, you receive a lot of money. Thanks again uh, for your effort. In the EU, something similar. The way in which subsidies are distributed and the way in which subsidies have been disbursed in the last 40 years of common agricultural policy is such that goods are artificially kept cheaper in terms of production but also that the inequality that is connected with the um, ownership of land is reproduced. So just looking at, at Britain, one in five of the biggest recipient of subsidies is a billionaire. And the queen herself received in 2012, I think, almost 800,000 pounds in subsidies from the European Union because of the um, land that she owns. So on the one hand, you have subsidies that are artificially making thing, food more um, competitive and that are rewarding and reproducing the inequality in terms of distribution of land. On the other hand, we have the Global South that has been repeatedly told by international actors like the World Bank that they should not uh, subsidize and finance in their own agriculture, that they were the victims of structural adjustment projects, that they were kept with their own <coughs> means without the possibility of intervening in the agricultural system. So that was happening in the 80s. More recently, we see that the same idea of integrating land and integrating people in the global production of food is happening through development. And I know that there's a lot of talk about development and human rights, and I just want to uh, mention one important initiative, which is the Global Alliance for Food and Nutrition Security, which is a project that was launched by the, the G8, so the eight wealthiest countries in the world, deciding that few countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they were going to become the bread basket or the green basket of the world, and they had to be integrated in the global value chains and in the global production. So I know that you heard about global value chains and trade a few weeks ago. This is a very interesting example where the global value chain is not only about trading, but it's also about natural resources, it's also about land, it's also about society, it's also about culture, it's also about self-sufficiency. It's about a lot of things that are not taken into consideration when you think that it is good for a country to take its land and transform it into an asset for global production. So every year the planet loses 18.7 million acres of forest annually, uh, which is 27 soccer fields every minute. A soccer field is more or less a football field, I would say, I don't know, <laughs> somehow. Is a, is, is a good amount, <laughs> and most of this land is lost, most of this forest is lost to produce soy, um, beef, and palm oil. So in order to feed more animals, in order to satisfy wealthier consumers, or in order to move cars and, and engines, we are integrating, appropriating, and grabbing 27 soccer fields every minute uh, that then intervene and integrate a new um, food system. So after 500 years of enclosures and coercion, the frontiers of food production are continuously and constantly pushed forward and encroach on the remaining indigenous land, on communal land, and on the lives of people that have been so far spared for the transformation into assets. So you see, you witness it, like you see it visibly. Like if you think about the Amazon, if you think about places like Colombia now with the, with the peace agreement and this idea of relaunching agriculture, you see places that have been spared from this global logic of commoditization, commodification, and, and transformation in assets that get integrated into, into the system. So what happens doesn't have only ecological impacts, of course it has social impacts, because the people who are deprived of the land, they have to go somewhere. 
and whether they stay on the land as farm workers, so they enter into the logic of capital and, and labor, and they start working the land that they originally owned, and they, they don't own it anymore, the original land where they were staying, and they don't own it anymore, or they just move somewhere else, and they abandon the land and move to the cities where they join the millions of people who are unemployed or with low salaries job, cannot afford food, or only eat unhealthy options. Uh, they join the, you know, the army of people who have to skip meals, suffer from physical and mental conditions related to the insecurity of their lives, and are trapped in the spiral of deprivation, marginalization, and exclusion. So land workers and marginalization are the pillars of the global food system that allows me to just walk into any restaurant and eat food that is coming from the other side of the world. So it's important that we uh, continue having this relational understanding. So what about law? I think that there is a lot of law and policy that I've already been indirectly discussing in my, in my account, but I really wanted to point at three specific areas uh, for those of you who are lawyers and also for, you, for those of you who want to become policymakers, because I think that the connection between what I've been describing and, and legal rules is clear. So normally we point at trade law and point at intellectual property law and say, you know, the, the rules of trade and the rules of intellectual, intellectual property are the drivers of this massive system of exploitation. So I leave that on aside. If you're interested, we can talk about that in the Q&A. What I want to focus on is, first of all, international investment law, um, system of international arbitration, bilateral investment agreements, countries signing agreements with other countries in order to foster their economy and attract investment. There are very interesting cases in South Africa and Zimbabwe where international investment law was used to protect land owned by families with clear um, colonial history and roots. So through international arbitration and international investment law, the appropriation of land that took place during the colonization was protected and reproduced. But more recently, there is a case, if you're interested, uh, in Tanzania that connects with this idea of integrating new land. So it's land that a few years ago was given to a Swedish investor, and the Swedish investor was gonna produce uh, palm oil to generation of energy. The only problem with the land is that really belonged to people. There were indigenous communities over there. They were like, raised their hand and said, you know what, we've been here for hundreds of years. Can you stop doing what you're doing? So they pushed the government, they lobbied the government, they had support from lawyers, and eventually the government recognized that the land belonged to the people. Immediately after, afterwards, the government was sued in international arbitration and asked 500 million, I think, or something like that, in compensation because of the loss um, profit and the loss opportunities that the Swedish investor was gonna be facing. So you see this idea of investment law as protecting private property, this idea of investment law that cannot really look at the history, that doesn't really look beyond the duality between the state and the investor, create this sort of vicious circle by which communities, uh, people with historical rights are completely marginalized and silenced. The other area of law which I think is somehow understudied and um, under discussed when we think about the creation of the food system and the cheapness of the, of the food system is competition law. Um, there are multiple examples that could be given, but I think that the Bayer and Monsanto example like, is the clearest one. So Bayer, top company in the pharmaceutical, Monsanto, top company in seeds, GMOs, and, and fertilizers. They get together, Bayer uh, buys Monsanto. The national competition authorities have to clear the merger. They have to decide whether or not there are problems from the perspective of competition law that may emerge or they may arise after the merger. The European Competition Authority and the European context, which is the one that I know better, they receive hundreds of thousands of messages, including from IPES Food, that uh, our friend Raj is, is a member of, saying there are so many problems in terms of biodiversity, environment, small-scale farming, dependency, pointing at all those issues that were being created by the merger between the leading pharmaceutical and the leading chemical and fertilizer. And in their answer, the uh, head of the European Commission Competition Authority, the commissioner said, we are aware that there were complaints, we are aware that people were worried about the environment, we're worried about labor, we're worried about biodiversity, but this has nothing to do with competition law. Competition law is only about price and consumer well-being. So what happened there is that by only looking at the impact of the merger on the well-being of consumers, so the final price, the availability of the products, and the investment in research and development, 
um, everything else disappears. And I think that that example offers an opportunity to look at the link between law, cheapness, ecology, and the food system. So the competition authority looked at the complexity of the food system. So they were aware of all of that. But they simplified it and represented it only with the exchange value, value, only with the price of the final good. So everything else doesn't matter as long as it's not represented in the price. If the price is silenced about that, there is not an impact on the price, why should we bother? So what I think that happened is with this idea of the European Community uh, Authority and, and the same thing happened at the, in, in the US and the same thing happened in South Africa and all the other countries that had to clear the merger, is they somehow enshrined the idea of cheapness as the aim of competition law and the market. They say the only thing that the market is about is giving cheap products to consumers and cheapness is represented by the price. There is nothing else that we should be taking into consideration. And so the idea that there is social environmental overexploitation, overconsumption, again to use Aragi, doesn't really matter. Overexploitation and overconsumption of natural resources and people is, according to the interpretation that I'm giving of the decision, is inherent and irrelevant. The third example, um, there are also a fourth example, so I may also talk about the fourth one if I have time. The third example is, of course, that of migrants' rights and, and, and migration law. So I was talking over lunch with people who are committed, engaged with, with migrants' rights and supporting migrants, and I think that I know too little about the American system and the US in order to talk about that. But the reason why I'm mentioning uh, migrants' rights and, and, and migration law is, first of all, for the central role that mig migrants are playing in the food system in the global north. Like the food system of any of the countries that we are familiar with in the global north would not exist without migrants. But what I want to mention is a specific intervention, legal intervention that took place in Italy, where the decontextualization of migration produced a very short-sighted and quick fix that didn't really address the root causes. So from a human rights perspective, uh, it tells you how not to do things if you really care about changing and transforming, and just how to do things if you don't really want to make anything different. So in Italy, we have around 400,000 um, people working in the agricultural sector as farm workers and most of them are undocumented migrants. So Italy is a very complicated uh, situation. There was an article on the flight coming here, the role that mafia is now playing, and, and agro-mafia, they call them, plays in controlling the whole, whole uh, food system in, in Italy. So the situation is very more complex than what I'm describing, but what happens with a lot of these migrants is that they have an intermediary, they have a gang master. With, in, Italy, in Italian, we call it the, the caporale, the, the sort of boss that is controlling the life of migrants and taking advantage of the condition of, of irregularity of these people. So the gang master is providing them with housing, is giving them transportation, is connecting with the farmers, and giving the farmers a very poorly paid job um, during the day when the job is available. So the previous government, before the current whatever government that we have, um, decided to intervene and improved uh, criminal regulation and said, OK, so there is this problem. So we cannot only address the role of the intermediary, we cannot only address the role of the gang master, we also have to address the role of the farmer who's taking advantage of the workers, which I think is a good way of looking systemically. So it's not only the person who is exploiting because they're you know, moving the farmers around from farm to farm, but it's also the person who is finally benefiting of the cheap cost of, of labor. The problem is that by looking at that and by introducing that quick fix without thinking systemically, there are at least uh, three things that are, that are missed. The first one is the role of Italy in actually generating migration. So it's just like, oh, migration happens, and then we try to fix it. And we know that Italian policies, European policies, and Global North policies in general have a lot to do with the reason why migrants come to Europe in the first place. But that's definitely not addressed when you try, try to change um, criminal law. The second point is that they changed the law, but they didn't think about migrants' rights and, and migration law. So they say, if you're a victim of abuses, you come and denounce, and then we take the um, response. The problem is that they're not giving any form of protection to the migrants. So undocumented migrants are supposed to self-declare themselves, self-denounce themselves as irregular migrants, and then risk to face uh, deportation and repatriation. So at that moment, the government is saying, oh yeah, we care about you, but we don't care about you. So the only alternative that the migrants have are silence, so they continue being exploited the way they're exploited, or just being visible and then risk uh, deportation. So they are completely disposable. 
And the third point that connects back with the idea of competition law and the role of competition is that by thinking only about the two actors, or the three actors, so the migrant, the intermediary, and the farmer, there was no intention in understanding why exploitation is happening in the first place. So why are farmers exploiting migrants? Why are they trying to keep the price of their products so low? And if you look at the way in which the market is organized in Italy, you see that there are lead firms, to use again the vocabulary that I'm sure that Dan Danielson was using when he talked about global value chains. There are lead firms who can exercise so much power on farmers that they push down the price of tomato to a level where if it's not through the exploitation of migrants, there is no market for the product. So by focusing on what is happening between the parties without thinking of the broader picture, there is no real systemic alternative that can be implemented. So these are just three of examples of how law in different forms outside of trade and outside of um, inte intellectual property determines the bargaining power and determines the, pos the position within the system and the way in which uh, both nature and uh, people are integrated. So I will spend five more minutes, I would say, thinking about what are the mainstream solutions and then a little bit on like the sort of um, systemic or transformative solutions that um, we are working on, which is that of the, of the commons. So I know that I'm gonna be generalizing and I don't wanna say that law is always bad and the law doesn't have any, any, any role in making things better, but I think that it is important to adopt a systemic and structural and critical understanding of law, including when law provides solution. So the first area that I want to talk about um, is that of sustainability and this idea that let's make the food system sustainable. And this you know, great enthusiasm around the sustainable development goals and now because 193 countries all over the world endorsed the sustainable development goals, uh, the future will be, will be great. So there are at least two main issues with the sustainable development goals and the idea of sustainability uh, from the perspective of the food system. The first one is that sustainability as it is presented is only looking forward, it's not historical. There is nothing about the violation, the inequality, the injustice that have been happening in the past. And one very good example is a case that I'm following now in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a Canadian company called Feronia um, is managing 120,000 hectares of palm oil production in RDC. So they receive money from um, development banks and they are oh, the, the paladins, the defenders, of the round table for sustainable palm oil production. They are producing sustainably. They are using very little fertilizers, they are treating the workers decently, and et cetera. So from a sustainability perspective, what you're looking at is, is Peronia implementing the standards? Is Peronia actually um, practicing what they, what they claim that they are doing? The problem is that if you focus on that, you miss a little tiny element of the story, which is these 120,000 hectares are part of a one million hectares concession that was given to the Lever brothers at the beginning of 1900 um, by the then colonial power of the King of Belgium. So you just look at what's happening now, you don't look at what is happening for the last 120 years, you only focus about the on the future, and you completely dismiss and obliterate everything that has been happening in terms of appropriation of land, violence, slavery, the transformation of the ecosystem, the fact that forest was cleared 120 years ago in order to start palm oil plantation, and also the way in which society has changed. So you had communities that were living in the area, they were evicted, palm oil uh, trees were put instead, and then people started working for the palm oil company rather than conducing, uh, conducting the, the life that they were conducting. So from an historical and critical perspective, there's nothing really that the sustainability can help us achieving in terms of, of transformation. But then there is also the point that sustainability is not really about addressing the deep rooted inequality of the, of the food system. So there is nothing about redistribution of means of production, there is nothing about like the inequality of power, it's just about keeping farmers alive and making sure that next year there's gonna be harvest. And this is something that you see very clearly in critical productions like coffee and cocoa, where all the sustainability projects are um, pushed and are supported by this idea that if we don't pay farmers a little bit more, if we don't reduce the amount of fertilizers, we may not have a harvest next year. And if Nestle doesn't have a harvest to buy, Nestle cannot exist. So it's mainly a sort of attempt of capitalism and, and the food system in itself to defend its position 
and avoid self-destruction. So how can we avoid self-destruction? It's like paying farmers a little bit more and reducing the ecological impact. The second mainstream solution that I want to share with you and that is, I think, very important because it's now mainstream all over the world. Um, in Europe, there are talks every single day about the importance of that and even in the US, it, it has become like uh, public policy in many places is this idea of redistribution of food waste and the solution to food poverty. This idea, there is an excess of food, there is surplus, there are people starving, let's match the two, and that's going to be solving both the problem of excess food and the problems of people who are impoverished. So there are three main reasons why the redistribution of food is considered to be the silver bullet. The first one is because food waste generates a lot of greenhouse gases. So if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest um, polluter in the world in terms of greenhouse gases after the US and, and China. Um, there is no more land, like where to put all the food that is uh, going to rotten, and that is clear in, in, in a lot of measures that have been taken. And then, as I was saying, it seemed to be a quick fix for, for the problem of, of food poverty. It's like, there is excess food, let's give it to the people who don't have access to food, and everyone will be happy. So sort of win, 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 multiplied win solution. So why from a systemic and, and inequality perspective that doesn't work? First of all, it doesn't really question the causes of poverty, uh, nor the reason why people cannot afford buying food or have to be fed with food that no one else wants. So poverty is taken for granted, poverty is there, it happens, just give them food and they will be happy. So food redistribution as it is constructed justifies the imbalance of power and legitimizes the status quo. Secondly, food redistribution does not question the fact that surplus is produced in the first place. So why there is an excess production? Why are supermarkets buying more? Why are, are we throwing away food? That's not really taken into consideration. On the contrary, surplus is considered a resource. Now becomes a good thing. Now producing more or exceeding in our purchase uh, becomes a resource uh, that can be useful to um, fix the problem with the, with the system. Thirdly, if you redistribute food, you're not really <coughs> questioning how the food was produced. So it can be produced in a very cheap way with you know, a very poor labor condition, environmentally in a, in a completely unsustainable way, but that's not really the matter. And even more interesting, there is no question about the nutritional content of food. It's this idea that, yeah, but people are starving, so give them whatever we have, and this is gonna be fine. And there are plenty of examples where you know, children and all those were being given uh, extremely sugary food as a, as a quick fix remedy that created more health issues than it actually solved. And finally, the, the point, point with food redistribution is that it doesn't really get rid of the idea of food as a commodity that is traded according to the exchange value and distributed, like taken away from the market, only when it has lost its uh, commercial appeal. So when no one wants it and you cannot make money out of that, that's the moment where you redistributed, but till that specific moment, it is a commodity, you own it, and you can do whatever you want with that. And it's very interesting to see, especially in the UK, and I'm sure that in the US too, if you, if you investigate, the same chains of supermarket and retailers that are uh, going full fledged with the idea of food redistribution, they're also raising their fences that protect the bins uh, around the supermarkets. So the idea is, is, yes, we are gonna redistribute food, but when we want, because the food is ours, and no one can come and take it, even if we have thrown it away and put it into, into a bin. And there are multiple cases where people have been um, sanctioned, including with criminal sanctions, for skipping and taking food from uh, bins. Okay, one quick word on the right to food. Um, so I'm working currently with the special rapporteur on the right to food. So it would be very hypocritical on my side to say that the right to food doesn't work, and it would be no, very sad if I were working for the right to food and then come in here and say that's the worst thing that we can have in the world. So I think that there is a possibility of a transformative uh, use of the right to food. And I think that there is a paper by Olivia de Schutter in 2011-ish. The last paper, the last report that he wrote as a, as a former uh, special rapporteur on the right to food that gives some ideas of the, of the transformative potential of the right to food. And I believe that the work that Ilal Alver is doing at the moment on the right to food is very much like uh, pushing forward uh, a different alternatives. However, what I'm challenging is this mainstream interpretation of the right to food. So we were talking over lunch of the prison loaf or the, the food loaf, and it's a very interesting example that Dan can, can share with you much better than I can, can share. But 
what is happening with the mainstream interpretation of the right to food is that the right to food of people is satisfied and protected when they are prevented from starving. Everything else doesn't really matter. And so to give you an example that I have been learning recently about, in the UK, asylum seekers were protected by law and they can stay on the country till the decision, the final decision is made. They receive 35 uh, pound a week, um, five pound a day in kinds and in uh, money. And of course, studies are demonstrating that this, what they receive during the week is incapable of providing them with a decent uh, quality of life. They not only cannot be integrated, they are completely marginalized and excluded from the rest of society, but also in terms of nutrition, in terms of access to uh, decent quality food. So when the measure was challenged and it was, yeah, you are giving them food, but you're not giving them quality food, you're not giving them enough, the response was from the court and the government was, we are not making them starve, that's the responsibility that we have, everything else is a surplus. So you see, if you're familiar with the work of Samoin, this idea that the right to food interpreted as sufficiency. If we achieve the level of sufficiency, we prevent people from starving, we have satisfied our obligation. So this is the vision of the right to food that I'm challenging. This is the vision of the right to food that I think is counterproductive because it's reproducing the same dynamic that someone can be uh, barely nourished, if not undernourished, and there is no violation of the, of the obligation. So overall, I, I would say that the imaginary that is uh, embedded in law is really, at the moment at least, and in policy, is incapable of being transformative. And so the complexity of the people and nature that make food possible is often hidden, is invisible, cheapness is not discussed, actually cheapness is a, is a resource. Um, and that is linked, I would say, with this idea that food is an object, food is a commodity, and every single element that composes the food chain is an object and is a commodity itself. The object like labor, nature, food, and everything, and soil, and everything that makes food possible can be appropriated, traded, and the only value that they have is the exchange value, the amount of money that it costs and the amount of money that you can trade it for. Uh, also, the current imaginary doesn't address the historical um, inequalities and doesn't really care about addressing the existing um, inequalities, so that the solutions are often superficial, short-term, and fragmented. So what to do? Like crying and being sad, yes, but on the other hand, there is optimism, and, and I think that there is plenty that is going on out there uh, that could be taken as a term of reference for positive example. So what we are working on and what we are suggesting in a book that is, that is coming out um, hopefully before the end of the year, is this idea of thinking of food as a non-commodity. So thinking of food as a commons and a commoning, uh, thinking of food as something that cannot be appropriated and the food system as something that doesn't uh, produce and that doesn't generate <laughs> objects, but a food system is based on something more or other values that are not only the exchange value. So the book is a collection of 24 chapters and 20 30 something authors, and I can tell you like it was extremely interesting but also very complicated to have conversation with each of them and talking about what commons mean and what commoning mean. So I don't have the answer here if you ask me like what does commons mean because 24 authors don't have the answer and I think it's, it's about the way in which we implement it and about the way in which we live it. And I think it's more about the political horizon and it's more about the anger also that it generates in the moment that we think about food as a, as a commodity and we ask ourselves but why is it that we value and why is it that something that is so essential to people and the planet is naturally taken as an object and naturally treated as, a, as an object. So I'm not going to talk about how would the food system look like if uh, food was a commons and if we were all commoning, but I would say there are three um, steps that I would invite all of us to, to take in order to move closer to a different interpretation and a different imagination of the, of the food system. So the first one would be the, the recognition of the relational and interconnected nature of the problem. So when I talk about relational, I, I always love the, the sentence that Susan George like, wrote already like 30 years ago. Th Susan George, an amazing person who is founder of the Transnational Institute, which is, which is an organization that does a excellent work on a lot of issues, including the food system. And what Susan George wrote was, if you want to understand poverty, study the rich, not the poor, because the poor know what is wrong with their life and because they're not those who actually have the power. So thinking relationally, 
means that if we think about food poverty, if we think about the marginalization, if we, if, you, if we think about inequality, we have to ask ourselves who is profiting, who has food when people have no food, who is taking advantage of the food system that is implemented and focusing on them as much as, if not more, than we focus on people who are actually living in poverty. The second point is, as I was saying, this idea of the interconnectedness. So the food system is extremely complex and complicated, and there are multiple forms of deprivation, appropriation, and subordination that take place across the chain. Um, you can think of workers, you can think of consumers who cannot afford it, you can think of farmers, and et cetera. Some of the victims, they don't even know that they are abused, and, and so this is an important thing to do, like reaching out and, 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 and doing this kind of advocacy. But even more interesting, there is very little communication across the food chain. So there is very little communication acro horizontally across the different level of the production. So one of the steps that we should be taking is really thinking of the way in which we can create an interconnected movement across the food chain that maybe around the idea that food is not a commodity can create solidarity and can create a political coherence. So the idea would be like to convince the, or to work with the migrants, farm, farm workers in Italy, and making sure that the struggle of the migrant farm workers is perceived as a struggle of the migrant farm workers, but also the struggle of those consumers who could not afford a more expensive tomato sauce, and the struggle of the farmers who are losing their land because they cannot put cheap products on the market. And I think that if we bring all together this, this struggle is, is not only a good thing to do, but it's essential in order to think a different um, food, uh, food system. The other step that I suggest we should take is this idea of going beyond the human implication of inequality and, and going beyond the human implication of, of food poverty. So if there is one little uh, message that I hope you will take home with you is this idea that the interconnection between nature and people uh, that is intrinsic to the food system. So looking at food poverty and inequality only from the perspective of the people would miss out everything that has to do with nature, everything that has to do with this ecological interaction. So adopting an, a commons-based imaginary really requires to constantly think about ecology, to constantly think about how nature and society are interdependent and interconnected. And this is definitely not happening if you adopt the idea of food as a commodity and the food system as exclusively producing a commodity. So commons and commoning, we say, is, is ecological by nature and really like is pushing us to go beyond this, this idea that there is something like nature, there's something like society, we can address the societal problem and not thinking about nature. And the last point about, about commons is that it really requires to look at the inequalities, not only of the present, but also of the, of the past. So commons means non-enclosed and collective. So if we have been seeing hundreds of years in closure, adopting the idea of foods as commons and food system as a commons means challenging and tackling and finding a remedy for those legacy of the past and redress it rather than coping with its implication. So it's not about sustainability within a very unequal society that has been created after 500 years of settler colonialism, but it's addressing, addressing that. So the idea would be to open the Pandora box of land redistribution, historical compensation for slavery and colonialism, the reparation for odious debt, like the debt that Haitian had to pay for their own liberation, <laughs> or the money that slave owners in the UK receive after the Abolition Act. It's about taking history seriously and redressing it. So commons and commonings uh, would also mean taking history seriously in the construction of our alternative and imagining legal structure, if we are gonna have legal structure, and that's a question that we, that's up, up to, for debate. Um, so legal structures that are capable of implementing an idea, the idea of reparation ecology, which Raj recently proposed uh, together with Jason Moore in the, in the book on the history of the world in seven cheap things. Uh, which is the idea that reparation is not only about people and ecology is not, about, not only about the present. So I know that has been a, a very dense and, and not particularly optimistic talk, um, but I hope that at least like inspires some of you to have a reflexive look at ourselves and also the social, social legal um, system in which we're all embedded and that continues reproducing a food system that instead of regenerating people in nature, uh, generates multiple social, environmental deprivation and injustices. So my, my hope is that you know, once you leave the room and, and whatever, um, some of you will be inspired to, to engage with the millions of amazing people who are fighting
from different perspectives and different tools to democratize, reappropriate, and radically transform the food system. So the opportunities are out there. I'm not an expert of this country, but I'm sure that there are plenty of opportunities out there. It's just about to go in and, and, and looking for them and joining. So for example, the work that has been done on farm workers and migrant workers um, here around this city and throughout the country is, is fantastic. But I think that, and going back to where I started, this idea that a lot of native communities and representative of native communities and Native Americans are trying all over the country to restore the diverse agroecological community-based and nurturing food system that was dismantled with the implementation of the colonial project. So they, they, are, they are trying to do that. They're facing a series of problems, and law and, and political representation are certainly among the hardest hurdles that they have to, to, to overcome. Property law, intellectual property, health and safety regulation, competition, and other areas of law um, are constructed and framed in a way to, to support the dominant food system. Um, and create a straight jacket around those who are trying to uh, implement alternative. So the idea is that if you're interested in decommodifying and recommoding the food system, in which we are all embedded, I assume, if we are here, um, maybe you want to start from there. Thank you. Um, holy hell, that's, uh, th th there's, well, th th first of all, let me, let me, let me do the, the, the standard genuflection and thank the Rappaport Center, uh, and Karen, hello Karen, uh, uh, and Dan, um, and, uh, and, and, and everyone at the Rappaport Center who's made it possible for, um, for, for, for Tommaso to be here and uh, overwhelm us with quite a lot of pessimism. Um, but also, you know, important insights. Um, I, for one, am pleased that I'm not the only person who doesn't know who the Italian prime minister is uh, and that uh, Italians also are a little uh, confused about who their government is right now. Um, I, uh, I'm also uh, pleased that, that you took down the idea of the, this um, crumbs from the table idea, you know, the, the idea of if only we repurpose food waste to feed the poor, everything's going to be great um, in, in, the, in the vein of, you know, eat up, eat, you know, children eat up their children starving in Africa, uh, th th that kind of uh, rubbish um, uh, moralism uh, and uh, public policy is uh, absolutely deserves to be skewered. I'm very glad you did. Um, uh, I'm also pleased that you began your talk and ended your talk with death. Um, because, uh, because it's important to remember, um, uh, and, and not least because today is uh, the, uh, the observation of uh, Veterans Day. Um, in, uh, in Britain, it's Remembrance Sunday is, is, is what it's called, Armistice Day. Uh, in Germany, uh, Volkstrauertag, um, the People's Day of Mourning, and I think the Germans get it right, um, unusually. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, we should mourn. Um, and we should mourn uh, the people, um, and not, jo not just those who died in the fields of Europe, uh, but those who died in the fields so that there could be a Europe. Um, Europe is, uh, I mean, it, it's important, to, uh, and uh, I, I, I love your talk for, for how it is that it drives us to, re, to, to reconsider uh, the past, uh, to, to reconsider the ground on which we stand. Uh, and a, a good way of doing that is to remember um, that uh, World War I, for example, uh, was, uh, if we are to uh, follow um, Avner Offer's magis magisterial book, World War I was an agrarian conflict. Um, and, uh, and when we remember that, we should remember Wilfred Owen's um, magical poem, uh, Dulce et Decorum S. Do, do people here know Wilfred Owen? Is it, is it, is it, I mean, in Britain, you, you, you have to learn him. Uh, but here, uh, so Wilfred Owen was uh, a, a, a soldier, uh, an anti-war poet. Um, he was killed in the First World War. Um, but one of his most famous poems, um, Dulce et Decorum Est, um, is, uh, is, is powerful listening. Um, and I, I won't read it all, but it's important that we you just hear the last few lines uh, of this poem that was about uh, soldiers being gassed. Um, and uh, he, he, he takes aim at the kinds of pieties of remembrance that, uh, that, you know, that, that uh, we, we engaged with over the weekend uh, and that we rightly mocked our president for, for not participating in because of the rain. Um, but uh, the, the, end of the, the end of the poem goes like this. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, 
My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Uh, the line, uh, dulce et decorum est pro, uh, pro patria mori, it is it, it, a right and seemly thing to die for your country. Uh, pro patria mori, to die for one's country. The Latin makes it a little easier to see how country, patria, and patriarchy are related. Uh, and we'll get to that because I, 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 I want to pull from you some optimism, uh, Tommaso, because I, I think that, 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 that you may have left us with a slight deficit on that. Um, but before we do, uh, some, some more pessimism because I, I feel like uh, there's never enough. Um, uh, and when we, I mean, th thinking about the First World War is useful because it reminds us uh, to, to reconsider how it is that times may uh, appear to have changed, but in some ways they haven't. Uh, I mean, the, the, in, in the First World War, Germans, for example, lost 20% of their weight. Um, and uh, th you know, they, 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 no one went famished because they engaged in what, what a number of societies do under those conditions. They, they sort of did war socialism. They rationed. Uh, they, uh, they cut back particularly on meat consumption. Um, but 19% uh, of German food was imported. Um, and nearer 30% of protein was imported. Uh, nearer 50% of their fats were imported in 1914. Um, and that's because uh, at the, you know, in, in, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, there was a very well-developed archipelago of international trade. Um, it, you know, we're familiar today with the giants of like Bayer and you know, Monsanto or uh, Cargill or Archer Daniels Midland. Uh, but in uh, the early 1900s, um, there were four large corporations that controlled over 50% of the world grain supply. Archer Daniels Midland, Bungie, Cargill, Cargill uh, and Louis Dreyfus. Uh, all of those, all of those corp uh, corporations are around today as well. Um, and it's important to, to see the First World War as an agrarian conflict, not just because it was a conflict between two very important dependent sides, uh, certainly Britain and Germany, uh, but because the war was a skirmish over the control over um, food. Uh, and food supply. And in fact, one of the ways that uh, Germany was brought to the negotiating table, one of the ways that the Treaty of Versailles was, was forced down Germany's throat was through a blockade of its imports of food and fertilizer and fuel, uh, the, the very things that it needed to feed its population. Um, and there was a, a, a US physiologist who visited uh, Germany in uh, 1916, and they said, yeah, had Germans been vegetarians, there would have been no problem. Uh, you know, part of the reason that, that, that Germany was suffering is because they, they, they were eating a bit too much ham. Uh, and, uh, and, and there was, in fact, a widespread slaughter of, uh, of pigs in 1916 as a way of reducing uh, the food import bill. Uh, but this physiologist went on to say, to the people of India, the ratio of grain to population would have constituted luxury. Now, I think that's very interesting. Uh, it, it's offered here in, in the case of you know, this US physiologist visiting Germany. Say, well, like, if only these people ate like Indians, everything would be fine. Uh, but of course, the, the, the problem is that Indians weren't eating like Indians uh, in 1916. India had been broken by uh, its colonizer, by the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, it's important to remember, of course, that, that uh, at the beginning of the 1800s, uh, India had a greater uh, GDP than England had. Um, but uh, through uh, colonization, uh, through the process described by um, Mike Davis in his magisterial book, Late, Late Victorian Holocaust, uh, India was reduced to vassalage um, and famine was, was, was made widespread uh, through the imposition of global rules of trade that are now very familiar. Uh, Britain made India and made the third world. Uh, through the, the promotion of uh, the, the golden age of neoliberalism. And um, again, Mike Davis does the math and says around 36 million people died, not because there was a shortage of food, but because uh, the, the rules of international liberal trade were being enforced. Um, now, that matters if we're interested in the idea of food poverty, if we're interested in the idea of where workers fit in. Um, because uh, the ideas of, uh, the, of poverty are not an accident of the food system. They're absolutely necessary. You can't have the modern food system without poverty. You need it. Uh, and Britain uh, twigged this pretty early on uh, and experimented with it um, with a plum in its first colony. Everyone knows England's first colony was Ireland. 
Um, and, and and that's it. I mean, you know, the, the, the the Irish potato famine, I think, is is, is um, an excellent example of how it is that poverty is, is an intrinsic part of the modern food system and the values of the modern food system. Um, because you, know, you, you, may, you may or may not know this, uh, but during uh, the, the Irish potato famine, um, I Ireland was forced to export grain, uh, export potatoes. 300,000 tons uh, were exported between 1846 and 1848. Uh, exporting in order to be able to pay its debt in ways that seem w would be very familiar to anyone who, who studies uh, you know, the, the, the histories of debt peonage in the global south. Um, but very interestingly, uh, Charles Trevelyan, uh, the British Assistant Secretary to the Treasury, got a knighthood for imposing these kinds of export uh, strictures uh, and said that, that the famine was um, a, a way of checking Un, uh, of, of reducing Irish population, and, and therefore, and I'm quoting here, the quote, uh, the famine is a direct stroke of an all-wise and all-merciful providence. Um, and it was an idea that was echoed in The Economist, um, but, you know, as, as, as you might imagine, uh, in, in, in 1946, when people could see the famine uh, breaking, uh, they argued that people should be paid more um, uh, in order to be able to afford food. Uh, and The Economist pushed back um, to, to demands around living wage, uh, saying, uh, and, and I quote here, to pay them, uh, hang on, so, so he's, the, the economist talking about uh, the Irish, and uh, to, to arguing against the, the idea of to pay them not what their labor is worth, not what their labor can be purchased for, but what is sufficient for a comfortable subsistence for, the, for themselves and their family, uh, the, the economist says, mocking this position. Do they not see that to do this would be to stimulate every man to marry and to populate as fast as he could, like a rabbit in a warren. In other words, that to apply this to Ireland would, to be, give br to, would be to give brandy to a man lying dead drunk in a ditch. Uh, so that's the economist, uh, end quote, uh, the, the, the economist uh, offering uh, sage commentary on, on, on uh, but uh, again, I mean, this is, this is neoliberalism, neoliberalism red in tooth and claw, right? This is the idea that without the motivating fear of penury and hunger, people won't work. Um, and with, uh, it, and we, if we go in and start messing about with uh, labor markets and the equilibrium price of labor, uh, we may have unintended consequences like uh, unchecked and unfettered population growth. And therefore, uh, you know, dislike it though we might, um, famine and dying children is just a way of uh, the labor market re-equilibrating. Uh, re um, so uh, that's uh, th th this idea of, of labor and cheap labor being essential to... Uh, the food system is both old and new. Um, it's new in the. I mean, you know, one of the stories that, that uh, Jason Moore and I talked about in our history of the world and seven cheap things was this um, this idea of uh, the, the chicken nugget and how modern chicken nuggets uh, require very cheap labor. You know, when you buy your chicken nugget and you know from wh wherever you. Whichever purveyor of chicken nuggets you choose to uh, to patronize, um, y uh, y they for every dollar you spend, about workers will get about two cents of that. Um, but in the United States, we figured out uh, some some very exciting ways of avoiding uh, paying even that. Uh, prison workers and the prison industrial complex is very important here. Uh, prison workers get paid about twenty five cents an hour for their participation. Uh, some ingenious uh, coffee, it's our coffee. Uh, some, some ingenious uh, chicken executives in Oklahoma. Um, have come up with uh, a way of killing two birds with one stone in addition to the chicken. Uh, and uh, the, 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 they've observed that there is an opioid epidemic uh, in the United States uh, and that there is still a very uh, high price for labor to work night shifts uh, on the chicken production line. Uh, and so uh, what, what they've done is set up something called Christian uh, Alcoholics and Addicts in Recovery. Uh, and uh, Christian Al Alcoholics and Addicts in Recovery uh, is uh, an institution that uh, offers to divert uh, people who are, com uh, who are convicted of minor crimes uh, resulted, uh, you know, that, that come from their addiction and from their substance abuse. And instead of sending them to jail, they're sent off to Christian Alcoholics and Addicts in Recovery. Uh, and, and what you do is during the day, uh, you will pray to Jesus. Uh, and by night, when there is uh, no one really to work on these chicken production lines, you will work for free as part of your rehabilitation uh, for, the, for the duration of, uh, of, of, your, uh, of, of your recovery. Um, now, this idea that uh, you will, yeah, and of course, you know, one of the great advantages of that is the workers don't get pay, paid anything. Uh, they're not really governed by the same health and safety worker, uh, you know, health and safety protocols. Um, 
and uh, although they are subject to the same kinds of maimings um, and losses of limb and uh, repetitive strain injury th that workers are in general on the chicken production line, um, they, uh, the, 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 this, the system is both incredibly innovative, uh, dealing as it does with, with the opioid epidemic, but it's also very old. Um, because to, to return to Tommaso's uh, initial encomium, uh, encomium for us to remember, uh, what did the Spanish do when they first came to the New World? Uh, they found indigenous people. Uh, they read them uh, a requirement uh, that they observed the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior um, and the, the earthly representatives of the, the, the monarchy of Spain. And then they put the indigenous people to work um, by day working and then by night praying to Jesus Christ. Um, so this is a, a very modern uh, wage system and a very old one. But this idea of poverty being built into the food system is absolutely uh, essential. And so in a sense, of course, you know, we, we find ourselves having come full circle. Uh, that uh, here we are in, in the 21st century, um, and we find ourselves with very old uh, ideas of how labor gets exploited, of how uh, you know, food import dependency uh, matters and structures the world around us. Uh, that you know, we find ourselves on a day where, where we, we celebrate the end of 100, uh, 100 years since the end of a conflict that was about that. Um, and you know, yes, th things have changed uh, in in in, you know, in the twentieth century. U-boats were used to disrupt disrupt supply chains, and who knows what they'll be using in the in the twenty first. Um, but I'm 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 keen for us to to think hard about what it is uh, that we can we can do about this. And I, I think that this this is where I I, I, want, I want to engage engage with your, your the last few minutes of your talk to for, to, to encourage us uh, or to, to draw from you some some of these ideas of of the commons, and also to point out some of its difficulties. Um, and I, I, I don't pretend to uh, have any ideas about uh, how, how to turn these around, uh, but luckily um, that's not my job today, it's yours. Uh, so, uh, I mean, when, when you think about the last lines of Wilfred Owen's poem, Pro Patria Mori, again, the, 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 to, to die for your country, to die for your patria, to die for your, you know, one way of understanding patria, of course, is to, to, to go to this idea of fatherhood. Um, and the modern food system is systemically sexist. Um, in, in, the, in the report that you quoted at the beginning, uh, where, where, where you observed that, that we are now in the third year of, uh, our, uh, of, of an increase not just in the absolute numbers of people who are um, malnourished, but also in the proportion of humanity that is malnourished. Um, the, the report also pointed out that across the board, women are more likely to be uh, malnourished than men. Um, and I wonder whether there's a difficulty for you here, because um, it's not just that the modern, that, that capitalism is patriarchal, which it is, uh, but feudalism was patriarchal too. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the development economist Esther Bozrop quotes uh, the prophet Muhammad as, uh, as saying that actually as soon as you domesticate, as soon as you have uh, things like the plow, as soon as the plow enters the home, goes the quote, so too does servitude. Um, and so it, it, well, you know, the argument here is that modern farming technology and monoculture is itself part of patriarchy. Um, you, as, you know, the, the last time that we can reliably point to societies that had gender equality, uh, they were hunter-gatherer societies. And insofar as those societies exist, exist today, um, the idea of gender equality survives. Uh, but in any society where there is crop domestication, and not only has crop been domesticated, but humans have too, uh, you see gender inequality. And that's something that the commons has to wrestle with. Um, however much we may, we, we may like the commons, uh, it's very possible to have a commons that is nonetheless patriarchal. And so that, that, that's, that's one difficulty. Um, the other difficulty is around this idea of commoning communes and, um, again, to, to think about another, another translation of patria, another uh, in, interpretation of patria is fatherland. And I, I wonder if we talk about the land in fatherland, um, and talk more about how it is that commons can be unsuccessful. Um, in a Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, article uh, in a, a special edition edited by Eleanor Ostrom, I think in 2011, uh, there are a series of articles that, that, that show that, that, yes, commoning is possible, that there are property relations uh, that, are, that abandon the idea of private property. Um, but in order to thrive, uh, you need uh, not to have uh, too much engagement with the private sector or the public sector, but you also need enough land for things to go wrong and people to be able to recover. Uh, what happens when there isn't enough land? Or what happens when the private sector or the public sector inserts itself into the commons in ways that destabilize the commons? How do you create commons from a system w w which we find ourselves now imprisoned as we are by the tyranny of private property rights? 
Now that leads us, I, th I think, to you know, to, to, to these these difficult questions uh, around how how we move from where we are to this you know this unalienated world um, uh, where w we can conceive us, of ourselves as commoners and commoning. Um, and again, uh, I, I don't have the answers, but I'm sure you do, uh, and that we didn't have enough time to hear them. Uh, and so um, I, 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 I want to thank you for bringing bringing up really these very central, very difficult questions, uh, so that. You and I can talk about them, and we can invite everyone else to join us in that discussion too. Uh, and so, Kate, I, I know I've, I've been quite the food system corporation. Like you gave me some rules, and I broke them. Um, so, but I, I wonder if you if if you can give us instruction about what what we should be doing next. Yeah, we're gonna. Do you can. Do you want to respond to the last one? I'd rather have other people ask simpler questions, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you also said it was gonna bring a little bit of optimism, and now it's like, oh, you already. Out on the table. I'm, I'm being optimistic that you'll be able to answer <laughs> oh, these right, questions. That's the optimism. That's, that's the optimism. That's high expectation. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not optimism. So we usually give the students first chance at yeah. questions, uh, the students who are in the class. Yeah, I would open up to, to, to people, uh, people first. People and then here, and then, well, we do follow the one finger, two finger, so if somebody has a follow up question, <laughs> I moderate can, can, you, can you be self-moderated? I see a person back in back there. Um, you should turn your mics on. So I think it's, it's on. It's just far away from my Hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So probably my recording Hello, wasn't working. <laughs> Thank you. So my question, my question kind of uh, bounces off that last question. I mean, what what is the role of governments and corporations in an overhaul of the global food system? Uh, and if they have a role, how 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 are they separated? You know, in order to like still have something that's <laughs> emancipatory or liberating. Thank you. We're taking one question at a time, or okay, yeah, I, another one. Oh, I can. Don't know what um, so in class, we did an exercise um, imagining what we see as comedy. Um, so you have the answer to Raj's questions, that's great. Yeah, yeah, right here. Um, <laughs> one possible answer um, that we've thought of is, you know, in, in the city of Austin, you can actually have chickens um, in your backyard. Um, and not only that, the city of Austin will give you a free class on how to take care of them. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, is this one of the things that you imagined um, when you thought about commoning, you know, and maybe on more of a grassroots level? Yeah, I can, I can try to use a microphone. Um, so thanks for, thanks for the question. And, and of course, the reason why I kept the comments at the, at the end of my speech was because I don't really have answers. And as I said before, it was very interesting, but also very complicated to engage with activists and scholars on the notion of the commons and commoning and see how diverse and multiple the understandings of the, of the commons and, and commoning is. What is clear, and then it goes to one of the points that Raj was, was making, is that Ellen Ostrom and the economic understanding of, of, the, of the commons as a common pool resource, which is a very sort of narrow and economic-based um, notion of what the commons is. Commons is putting together resources and people self-managing it, and then automatically it leads to something different from the tragedy of the commons, which is the reason why Ostrom was interested in that. So the idea was people do not have rules, and if you give free access to a good that belongs to everyone, they will over-exploit it. So the original theory of the, com the theory of the common proposed by Ostrom is an answer to that and say, no, there are many cases in the world that even if multiple people or actors have access to the same resource, they will protect it and they will regenerate it rather than over-exploiting it. So the mainstream and the, and the sort of most diffuse understanding of the commons is this, and I think that it creates a lot of the issues that Raj is talking about. It doesn't consider patriarchy, it doesn't consider like colonialism, it doesn't consider the historical legacy of how we got here, and is always trying to look forward and say, how do we fix what we have, uh, and how do we fix it within the context that we have already, um, that we are facing today. I think that the idea of commons and commoning that, that I have in mind um, is really asking structural and systemic questions and rethinking uh, not only the food system, but rethinking society as a whole, starting from this idea of time matters, um, inequality matters, and the reproduction of, of subordination of nature and this objectification of nature um, matters. How does that transform into the food system? So I would say the first answer is you cannot fix the food system starting from what we have today. So I think that there is a redistribution of, the, of, of, the, of whatever has been allocated through hundreds of years of, of domination, imperialism, and colonialism, patriarchy, et cetera, that has to take place. 
because otherwise it's just going to be a quick fix that is going to fall in the same in the same trap of short uh, moment of, of uh, fresh air and then we're going to be back to square one. So in the in, in the idea that we are developing that we're thinking of is really to get together around a notion that is you cannot speculate, you cannot see food as a thing, you cannot see food as something that generates revenues and that is traded on the basis of the exchange value. Food is much more than just a, just, just an item. Food is like social relationship, food is sharing, food is a medicine, food is environment, is ecology, is, is future generation, food is like the pleasure of sitting around the table and etc. So how do you fit that into the understanding of the corporation and the world I think is, is, is impossible. That there is no way in which the corporate structure that is based on maximization of revenues can genuinely produce all this value, take into consideration all these values. On the other hand, I think that the public authority that we may not call government, we may not call state, we may not call like law and et cetera, but the getting together of the community can facilitate certain certain processes. And I I don't know if it's about putting chickens in the backyard, but I'm sure that it's about intervening actively in, in redistribution and creating and creating opportunities and creating spaces of democracy. So I think one interesting example of commoning could be like the food the food councils that are happening in some places where you have the people making decisions about their own food and, 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 and also like the notion of food sovereignty is certainly going in that direction where you want to democratize the, the food system. Um, so there is a, a theory of the of the commons that see the state as a facilitator, like the state is in participating together with the people and creating the space and the possibility for the people to make decisions uh, based on different values that are not only the, the exchange value. But I'm aware, I'm aware that, that politically speaking it may be appealing, like in pragmatic terms is, is not, but I, as Raj did with me, I would say I can you know kick the ball and then someone else would be playing with that. And I think the important thing is to make sure that specific values and principles are respected and the specific values and principles should inform whatever is happening. And I love the idea of commoning, because commoning is dynamic, commoning is moving, commoning is working together, commoning is doing things without really knowing where we're going, but you implement and reproduce a different imagination, a different imaginary, and you do things differently. And I think the commoning and working together and being together on the basis of the idea that food is not an, a commodity is naturally, inevitably leading to a different food system. Then it can be chicken in the backyard, Maybe we don't need meat. Maybe we can do like even without that. Um, but it's definitely a food system where it's not about distributing crumbles, but it's about building together uh, opportunities and, and building together different spaces, where speculating, generating profit, and considering food only as a good that can be traded on the basis of the exchange value is impossible. No, but I would love to hear what you think, what you think about commons and commoning and, and reparatory ecology. Like. Is that okay? That, that would, would you mind? <laughs> I don't know. Like, but I, I mean, I, I, I was hoping you'd talk about um, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, I mean, I, I think that the, the, in a sense, again, to, to, to think about the end of capitalism, which we must, um, the, I mean, the origins of, of capitalism are in periods of, of epidemic disease and climate change. Uh, feudalism collapses after the medieval warm period ends, and then the Black Death uh, changes the balance of power uh, from uh, you know, vis a vis you know, sort of workers and lords, or peasants and lords. Uh, and a range of different social systems emerge in that interregnum. Um, commoning was, pre, you know, was one of the ways through feudalism. W that allowed peasants to survive. Uh, but again, it's, it, it was a patriarchal institution, not as bad as uh, what then followed on, on the capitalism where um, women weren't allowed to work uh, for, for wages, uh, they weren't allowed to uh, know, they weren't allowed to teach, they weren't allowed to heal. Uh, the household became um, the, the sort of bourgeois uh, prison. Um, but the, I mean, I, I think that, that without sort of going too far down the road of sort of Rebecca Solnit's idea of a paradise built in hell, um, which I think has some problems. Uh, the, the, uh, I do think that there are uh, examples of how uh, different sorts of social system emerge uh, when capital can't be bothered and the state is absent. 
Um, so whether in northern Malawi or possibly in Puerto Rico, that would be an example. Um, but the state isn't the kiss of death to these kinds of things necessarily. So Cuba would be another interesting example of where uh, forms that have to be fought against the state, um, where uh, worker cooperatives end up being very powerful agents for uh, controlling land and imagining different kinds of distribution system, um, they end up being quite powerful. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that there, there are examples of transformation, all of which are characterized by control and sovereignty over land, and people fighting the state in one way or another, or the state just not being there, and the private sector not giving a crap. Uh, uh, or monopoly capital. This isn't to say that, that there aren't markets. There are, and they can, they can, be, they can, they can be very rich and vibrant. Um, but I do think that that kind of commoning is, uh, happens in these sort of post-capitalist spaces, or in these prefigurative spaces. Um, and that's why I'm so interested uh, for, for the conference that will, that will be happening later on this month, uh, because I'm very keen to be hearing what, 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 you know, how it is that that has thrived and persisted and what, what, what challenges that, that faces in the medium to long term. Um, so what change in law can help the problem of the financial sector with like dealing who and where gets uh, money? for like labor and food costs. Um, would it, a solution be to like ban hedge funds as investors because they're known to be less socially responsible? Um, and then also to the question of maybe over-the-counter derivatives, did the Dodd-Frank Act help solve that problem at all? You wanna add another one? Sure. So we've, We've argued that certain practices in sustainability are ultimately difficult to celebrate because making certain aspects of the system less harmful also makes it more durable. It improves behaviors of the system, but also perpetuates the existence of said system. So are any changes short of systemic overhaul even po ever positive? And is there such a thing as progress, given this paradox that you've, and many others have identified? So is, is, is anything good short of Revolution. I don't. I don't. I don't mean to sort of caricaturize the question, but it, it feels like the endpoint of that assumption. Um, yes. Um, so thanks for the question. So the, the the question of financial sector, I I think is very important because it's pretty much an area and a relationship with the food system that is not taken into consideration. Like there's a lot that is happening at the financial level, and very few people talk about that especially in, in circuit like, like this one. We, we take it for granted while uh, farmers on the ground are much more aware than, than we are about the impact of financialization. So there are two levels of financialization, like if we want to, to, to specify a little bit more. There is the financial market and the financial sector that is buying commodities and future and selling shorts and, and that is operating on the financial market um, as a pure speculation, which is this idea that you can make money out of assuming what the price of coffee is going to be, the price of coffee is going to be in, in six months from now or tomorrow, including through high frequency trading. And I think that to, against that specific um, speculation, that specific financialization of the food sector, there are in intervention that you could be doing at the level of regulation. So not allowing the purchase of um, derivatives if you don't have an interest in the underlying assets. So derivatives were born as a protection, as an insurance, as a guarantee for farmers, and now you can trade in derivatives even if you've never been a farmer in your life, and even if you will never be receiving the underlying assets. You can buy coffee in six months from now without having any interest in actually receiving the coffee. The only thing that you want to do is, like, is trade into the piece of paper that represents it. There are ways in which you can intervene, but I think that the underlying assumption of, of financialization is that food is a tradable good and food has a financial value and that's the way in which it is represented, and it creates massive distortion from the perspective of farmers. And it starts from the idea that you can generate a financial return on food, which is like an essential element of, of life. And I think that if the starting point is a decommodified understanding of food, financial speculation is incompatible. And so I would not just be putting remedies, I would just thinking about like the, the elimination of, this, of, this, of these practices, which at the end of the day are not even generating liquidity for the people on the ground. So there's not even a justification from the perspective of farmers because that's not the way it goes. The different form of financialization of the food system is that of the financial investors that are putting their money into food production transformation or, or distribution, like BlackRock, for example, that 
uh, used to own 7% of Whole Foods before it was sold to, to Amazon, or BlackRock, again, that was both a shareholder of Monsanto and a shareholder of, of Bayer. So you have this massive, large financial um, hotspot that invest in the food system because they understand the financial potential of the food system, generating revenues between 7 and 12% a year out of the fact that people have to eat. And again, if you start from a decommodified understanding of food, like you cannot accept that the food system becomes a, a source of rent seeking. Just putting your money there, knowing that people are going to be in need of food and therefore uh, making money out of, out of the, the desire of people to, to survive. So I think that for me, like a, a decommodified understanding of food and financialization are the two extremes of, of, of the spectrum. And there's very little that I would say of financialization as it is. Having said that, uh, easy access to credit for farmers at the, on the ground, which is not microcredit, which is not another form of enclosure and exploitation of farmers, may be very useful. But that's completely different premises than what financial actors and financialization are, are doing. And we could go on and on and on forever about the impact of financialization on, on the food system. And in terms of revolutions, like how revolutionary is the idea that you know, historical odious debt has to be repaid or that countries have to be uh, held accountable for the disaster they've been creating uh, in terms of climate change on more marginalized and more vulnerable countries? How revolutionary is the idea that if you receive your land from the uh, colonial power in, in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you're giving your land back because it's land that you've been stealing from people? I don't see that as revolutionary. I see that as taking responsibility for a, a, a legacy and a history. So I think it's important to look at the roots, root causes of what we have today and assess them. But I think that because sometimes like talking about revolution may scare people off and they say, no, I don't want to be part of anything that is like crazily insurrectionalistic and stuff. And I think that there is nothing like that. Like fighting the outcome of 500 years of imperialism, colonialism, patriarchy, and et cetera, I don't think is revolutionary. It's, it's probably the only way forward, right? No, but I, and I was not meaning. <laughs> Depend I think, for example, like if you think about from a legal perspective, the land that has been taken from the communities in Congo is you can make a legal argument that that land was taken, deprived against the right that are recognized of those communities. So when you implement the rights of the communities, you're not acting revolutionary. You're not breaking, smashing, or imposing a different system. You're still operating within whatever you are allowed to play with, which is the recognition of indigenous rights and in the, in the recognition of, of traditional and communal rights. Definitely implementing a full-fledged commons-based food system would require like, a lot of tension and political debate. But I think that you know, we have to be political, we have to be political aware, and we have to be politically active if you want to change things. And if any change that goes against the system that has been created in the last 500 years is revolutionary, probably we need revolution. But I, I, I don't see it like, I think there is a, like, from my, we may come from different backgrounds and the way in which we see revolution, but I think it, it, it. Sure. Yeah. And I think we destigmatize it, also recognizing that if we talk about debt, and if we talk about historical debt, if we talk about what is being created, like it's not revolutionary to ask for that to be repaid. Because you can also make the legal argument. There has been legal argument that has been made in terms of slavery. There is the legal argument that has been made in terms of colonialism. There is the legal argument that has been made in terms of climate change. There are legal arguments that are not revolutionary that can be deployed and used in order to at least change the starting point of the conversation. And I think to go back to what Raj was saying, like in the context where we are, private property, monopoly capitalism, and et cetera, there is very little space for any systemic and radical, and radical in the sense of going to the rules solution. If you change that, then the term of the conversation changed completely, and then you can start thinking about implementing a different food system. But I, again, I don't think it's, it's revolutionary because it's, it's just about claiming back what has been taken away from people and from nature in the last hundreds of years. And again, I don't think that when indigenous communities make a claim that they should be you know, given back the land that has been taken away from them, they're revolutionary. As much as women have been you know, hunted as witches and et cetera, like it's, it's not revolutionary. I think if we think it's revolutionary, we don't see the illegality and the violence that is in inherent in, in the system that we have that we have created. What? We have the master of revolution. You, you open the door. Um, <laughs> so um, no, I I, I, I I think you're right in reading what what he's saying is yeah no revolution. That's, but uh, I I think also uh, I mean th that that's not an argument against doing anything short of revolution uh, because. 
uh, you know, again, the, the Black Panthers argument, uh, there, there is around the world a dignified emergency among the poor. Um, it needs to be addressed. And what the, you know, the, the, the Black Panthers uh, approach to food was different from your regular church food bank, because I mean, even though the, the food was the same, um, at the Black Panthers you had uh, food that was about survival pending revolution. Uh, and it's not, it's not, I mean, I, I think that there is a, a valence a, 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 of intent about uh, the, the, the terms through which you engage in sustainability. Is this, is this to patch the system or is it to s help people survive so that we can build something better? And I think, I think what we're both saying is the latter. Uh, but th that doesn't mitigate, that, that, that doesn't militate against any kind of sustainability intervention. Um, but the, the valence of it, seem, the political valence of it matters a great deal. And I think you're, 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 reading, you're reading that correctly. But I also wanted you to get, make, make a, a point about, or, or just pressing on something that, that's a corollary to the, the insurance uh, issue or the, the finance issue, which is not, not about making access to credit available to farmers, but the other thing that uh, finance purports to do is provide an insurance function. Um, and particularly in a time of climate change, uh, the, uh, when you know, the, the, the futures uh, market offers itself as a, a marketplace for insurance. Uh, and who doesn't want insurance in terms of climate change? Uh, and so I, I wonder if you can see, or you've seen, or c c can propose ideas uh, that offer that kind, or offer an insurance that doesn't involve um, high finance. Uh, good question. So I haven't come across, like, I don't, I'm sure that like agroecological production like is, is an insurance against climate change. And I think that there are examples, again, to go concretely on the ground of what people have been doing, organized around the commons in communities that have been afflicted by climate change, like Puerto Rico and, and Barbuda, which is a, a place where I've been recently been working with and, and seeing how people are organizing to mitigate and adapt to climate change in a way that is independent from donors, that is independent from finance, that is based on bottom-up grassroots, like ways of doing things in the way that they've been doing for hundreds of years, just um, resilient by definition, because that's what agroecology most of the cases is. I think the, um, the insurance point is, is really the, the tricky one because as you're saying, like when you t say the finance is providing insurance, who doesn't want insurance? I'm also wondering who eats insurances? Like if, if the crop fails, um, who is actually gonna be capable of having access to food and what are the farmers, farmers eating? So there is this simplification and standardization and homogenization of food as something that can be represented by an insurance and you go around, you distribute insurances and then if everything fails, at least they're gonna have the money. But what do you do with the money is the question that no one asks because you're creating a system that is exposed to, the, to climate change because it's mainly monoculture, depending on, on green packages and, 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 and chemicals and stuff. On top of that, you put the insurance, so the f crops are deemed to fail. They may be receiving some money in very dodgy schemes of insurance that are Based on, paid on the basis of the climate performance of the index, so it doesn't really matter how much you lost your crop. And there are schemes that have been deployed like throughout the world where insurance, again, are utilized in order to extract revenues from farmers mainly. So the point is that you promise money in exchange for failure of crop, and then people don't know what to eat because with the money they cannot do anything. And then again, you reproduce the same system of like, they abandon the land, they go into the city with a little bit of money and, and, and et cetera. So I think the finance has very little, like speci especially macro finance, the sort of macro players have very little to do. And I think that there are amazing example on the ground of people that are supporting each other, that are creating schemes of mutual help and aid and, and financial or non-financial help that are much more interesting to study and to start with than this idea that there is a representative of financial corporation that can go around the world and distribute like microfinance scheme and microinsurance schemes to, to farmers. Oh, question. So if, if um, as you propose, like just kind of get rid of investors who aren't, if I understand that right, like already involved in the agricultural part of whatever they want to invest in, if you say limit it to that, wouldn't that then hurt if people wanted to say like grow or change what they're growing, which sounds like it would be needed if we're actually going to fix the system? And when saying limiting those investors and limit um, farmers' ability to do so? Talking about derivatives. Because I was saying like in terms of derivatives and the idea that you can speculate on something that you're not interested in. Okay, just the derivatives. So this is, this is the first part of, the, that of my answer was about like speculation and derivatives that are, have been created for specific reasons, like insuring as, as Raj was saying, and now they're used just as a form of investment. Um, even when the derivatives are used by people who are actively involved in the food system, 
there's a very interesting and perverse dynamic that I saw like personally happening in the case of coffee, where you can have the price of coffee being very low, so the, the farmers don't want to sell coffee. And the trader doesn't offer more money. Why is that happening? Because the trader is investing in the financial market as in making return out of derivatives that the trader is buying. So you start this sort of power dynamic between farmers who have no access to financial instruments and they should not have access to those financial instruments because they are, as we were saying before, like they have nothing to do with the, with the kind of production that we are, they were imagining. And then on the other hand, a trader, they can wait as long as they want because while they are waiting, they are making money out of the financial investment that they have been making, like represented by the piece of paper. So at a certain moment, they just wait for the farmer to give up because the farmer has to send the kids to school, pay for hospitals, pay for you know, consumption, and et cetera. So even if you create the possibility for those who are invested in the food system to have access to derivatives, the power dynamics and the power imbalance is so big and massive that you just reproduce the inequality because you're giving opportunities in a very squeezed and, and very unbalanced way. In terms of like, do we need BlackRock investing? Like, I, I suggest that you go on, on YouTube and you watch the video, mm -hmm. and you get the sense of what kind of agriculture they have in mind. Because the, 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 the most interesting thing from a financial perspective is that you cannot invest in micro-scale agroecological production because you cannot make a business case for that that is capable of fitting in your algorithm and is capable of giving you the data and the information that you need in order to present the investment to your investors. So what you need is something stable, homogenized, standardized, certain inputs, certain outputs. So if you look at the kind of images that they are, that they are presenting is large scale monoculture with GMOs for feed, uh, to feed animals. So if that's the way they're going, I don't think that we need them. So we may want to think collectively about ways in which you can provide credit to farmers who want to switch, who want to change, but it's definitely not coming from the headquarter of BlackRock where they can only see a certain amount of inputs and a certain amount of outputs. Um, so I, I feel like the way that we think about food um, is kind of a, a more informal perception, almost a state of reality that in the way that we think of things. And I guess my question is, how do you go about shifting an entire kind of population's view of food and to get them to think about food as a right? So I have a um, personal history of optimism, which is when we, surprisingly, um, we ran a referendum in Italy in 2011 on the idea of water as a commons. And we had 27 million people going to the polls and, and voting, say that they didn't want water to be privatized. And I think, and that happened like in four or five months. So you created the political awareness around this idea of privatization of water as, a, as a, not only an essential good, but also a common good that has to be managed differently that, than appropriation and, and privatization. And, I, and I, when I think about that, like I don't see any difference with food. Like, and, and, and the only thing is that we're not used to think about food in this way. While a lot of communities, a lot of people, a lot of realities out there think of food differently, but also if we imagine our own life, there are plenty of opportunities during our life where we engage with food in a different way that is not just commodity-based. You cook a, a, a pie for someone, it's not the materiality of what you've been cooking, it's about a lot of other things. Can you express that in monetary terms? You can't. So there are a lot of ways in which food is not commodified already in our, in our life, but we take it for granted that the only way in which we can feed ourselves is by buying something that has been treated as an item in all its aspects and creating externalities and, and et cetera. And I think, again, as I was saying, the, um, the idea of the commons and commoning is, is, is more of a political project than, than a mere uh, you know, academic thing. So it's going around and, and, and starting this kind of conversation and having all of you then thinking at what it would look like or what it would be not to think about food as a commodity and the food system as just capable of producing commodities on the basis of commodified inputs and commodified outputs. And, and I, as, as, as Raj was saying, like, then we go back in history to find example and, and optimism. So it was like that not that 100,000 years ago. So of the entire history of humanity, this idea of hyper-commodified, hyper-objectified uh, food and food system is very new and recent. So we've been doing things different as a humanity for, for thousands of years that, that we've been on the planet, and I think that we can go back. But we have to be aware, we have to have memory, we have to be conscious, and also like to 
try and, 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 and see where we go. And, like, and, and commenting is really that. Commenting is like starting from assumption and then making an effort and, and trying and, and, and pushing forward without really knowing where we're going, but knowing that we are not accepting what the, the, the straight jackets and the, and the contemporary constraints are and then see where we go when, do, when we do things differently. So, um, so it, it seems to me that in order to do the things that you would have us do, we have to change not just h how we produce food, but what we're producing, right? And, you know, when people say there's more than enough food in the world to feed everyone, it's, it's that sort of starts from the current food we're producing, right, which is monocultural, which is low value but maybe high calorie, which is, you know, so, so I, I'm wondering if, if, if um, someone has done sort of feasibility studies to, to sort of counter the green revolution trope that, you know, if we are to feed everyone, we must go in this direction, right? It, it has, it, is there s someone who's doing sort of interesting work to say, look, if, if we really sort of diversify the way in which we produce food, if we produce food in a way that is ecologically responsible and sustainable, if we produce food in a way that respects sort of the relational nature, and all these things that you would have us do, that yes, w no problem, we can feed everyone. So three things come to my mind. The, the first one is definitely the changes to be at all levels of the food chain, so it's not only about consumption and production, but also distribution and transformation, that means that maybe we have to rethink the idea of an international global food system and then relocalize again. And, and, and that's where I think the notion of food sovereignty is very, is very interesting and important in, in thinking about that. The second point that comes to my mind is that, if I'm not wrong, 70% of food is produced by small-scale farmers. So already the majority, like more than the majority of the food is produced, like maybe not in a super ecologically friendly way, but definitely not in monoculture, not in large scale, not in capital intensive. So it exists, it's already there. The point is that all these farmers and their food get captured in these you know, macro chains or et cetera, and then they become invisible and we think that we can only survive with the uh, help of monoculture and, and large scale. And the third point is, wi which resonates to me, is, is this idea of this new Malthusian argument and the way in which it has been deployed, which is fantastic. And I think if any of you has time, and I don't know, probably it has already been done, but I never read of it. Look at the way in which this argument is used and who is deploying it. This idea that there is not gonna be enough food in 2050. We have to feed 10 billion people. And look at what are the solutions that they're proposing. So BlackRock and all the investors, they are putting money in reproducing this argument that there is not enough. And the only way to go and satisfy the needs of the people in 2050 will be by expanding production, expanding productivity, increasing yields, and et cetera. So first of all, we have to reject this kind of narrative and paradigm, then there is not enough, and, and stop with this idea of the new Malthusian, because again, if we're back in history, who was Malthus, what were the arguments, which kind of, of scenario was he operating in, says a lot about the, the arguments behind, behind his, his theory. So I think that food is already produced by small scale farmers in the world, they're already there, we just have to learn from them, reproduce it, and, and, and being capable of doing as good as they are doing. The point is that I don't know how to farm, so for me it's much easier to get a tractor and going around and spraying fertilizer than working in the way in which millions of farmers, campesino and peasants are working on a daily basis. Am I ready to do that? Probably not because I'm lazy, and so I, I will have to learn. And I think all of us we will, or, or maybe not, and maybe there are gonna be plenty of people who are gonna be doing that, and we will act as responsible consumers supporting them through community-supported agriculture, because not everyone has to become a farmer, but definitely farmers have to be uh, doing the job, um, and, and they have to be remunerated and rewarded for what they're doing. Uh, so obviously going forward from, um, you know, redistributing the means of production of food, obviously that's not going to happen for some time. And we're all consumers of food on a daily basis. Um, so how does somebody who is consuming food in the here and now uh, maybe do that a little bit more responsibly, um, other than, you know, the more performative ways in which we consume that are only available to more wealthy people? Thanks for that. Um, you made me think and remember that 
one piece of legislation for those of you who do law, which is very interesting, is the recent declaration on the rights of peasants, because it's, it's structured around this idea of ownership of the means of production and, and the link between peasants, land, and, and means of production, and really to support small-scale farming, how much it's important that we guarantee that we put farmers and the farmers are put in a position where they can uh, do their job and the obligation of state in guaranteeing that. So going back to the, the role of state. In terms of um, how can we be responsible consumers without you know, having massive financial opportunities, um, two things. The first one is that's exactly where I think that the role of the state and the redistributive policy um, has to, to kick in. So resources, instead of being spent in order to you know, finance nuclear projects like Trident in the UK, they can go and subsidize healthy food produced by small scale farmers so that people can have access to it instead of being um, prevented from for, for financial reasons. Secondly, I, I would you know, suggest that you go out, you talk to people and ask about the community supported agriculture schemes that exist and the way in which you can be involved with that and maybe by volunteering, reducing like the amount of money that you have to pay for your, for your scheme. There are things that are happening. It's very hard for small scale producers to reach out to people because it requires time, requires money, requires energy, but you can go out and, and, and look at what is, what is, what is happening. And I, I don't know the situation in the US, but I can tell you like in, in the UK, like it, it's growing just, and the more protected the farmers are feeling, the easier it's gonna be their job and the cheaper it's gonna be the product because they know that they can produce and they have someone who buys that, so they are not completely exposed to the, to the argument of the market. Hardly is going to happen in a very high good uh, you know, farmer market that happens once a while where everything costs like fifty fifty dollars and etc. That it's, it's not the kind of, of future that I that I envisage. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you.